Okay, let's have a class. Uh, will be our second and last class this semester. So we will continue to talk about uh, carbohydrates and then we talk about oligosaccharides. So this is what we have, the oligosaccharides. So first of all, what is oligosaccharides? This is basically is 2 to 10 sugar units. That means uh, monosaccharides. What do we all mean? The sugar units. If the sugar units is more than 18 to 20, we will say this is a polysaccharides. And uh, this will be talked about together with starch on Thursday. Now, only the saccharides, how they connected by the sugar units, by monosaccharides, basically is one for glycosidic bonds. Because of the formation of the glycosidic bonds, they need to have glycosol. We need to make sure the spelling is correct. They need to form the glycosol. And the glycosol have two different ways to generate. So number one, if it's in vitro, that will be happened in the intestinal area, that is usually rely on glycosol transferase. And but more often in the food manufacturing process, it could happen in vivo or in vitro, there will be hydrolysis of poly Saccharides. This is easy to understand. Okay. Now, uh, oligosaccharides uh, not really often happens in the nature. Lots of them is actually coming from is polysaccharides. So something we want to say now. In our textbook or in the food and microbiology area, we basically talk about is disaccharides. And disaccharides, I said very simple, this is di sugar, which means the two monosaccharides combine together with one four glycosidic bonds most of the time, not always. And we will focus on talk about the three examples, which is number one, maltose. Number two, lactose, and number three, sucrose. And we will talk all of them in a little bit of detail, talk about structure and uh, uh, all the application in the food microbi uh, in the food chemistry area. Okay, so the first thing we want to talk about is maltose. Okay, first of all. What is the structure of maltose? It is relatively easy compared to the others. It is D glucose with D glucose. So it's very simple. Glucose and glucose combine together and <coughs> become maltose. And uh, that could be alpha glucopyranose with beta glucopyranose. Now, what it looks like? So we're going to go back to talk about this. So first of all, we draw a glucose. Okay, we draw glucose. If it's alpha, we're gonna put the hydroxy down. So H, H, O H, O H, H, 
H, H, H, CH2, OH. This is alpha. Okay, what's a beta looks like? This is go up, so we draw right here. This is go up, then go down, then go up, down, go up, down, then you go here, this will be down, up, CH2, OH. So, how they connected? They connected right here. Okay, they connected right here. So, let's just uh, uh, remove it. Let's just uh, remove it. Will become just like that. Just draw like this. So, one prime, two prime, three prime, four prime, five prime, six prime. And go here, it is also the one prime, two prime, three prime, four prime, five prime, and six prime. Okay, so that's why this is here. One four glyco cyclica bonds. Now, the very important, another thing we want to mention is right here. This is a free aldehyde group. So that's why we call it hemiacetal. And uh, lots of the textbook, they want you to understand so they do OH, okay, like that. So that's a chemical structure. But the second thing will we come from, we will come talk. Where is the maltose comes from? Maltose come from starch become maltose. Where this comes from? They need beta. Emilis. Now, when you see the maltose, this the words seems like it's familiar. When we talk about familiar, we talk about the malting. What did this talks about? It talks about the beer brewing process. So we have a barley. Okay, like this. This barley is major components is starch. And they have amylase, however, the yeast cannot use it. So what they have to do? You have to do the soaking. In a couple of days, couple of hours, depends on different temperatures. And then the beta amylase will be released, and then they will generate the maltose. And the maltose will go ahead and break down, become glucose. And then the yeast could use it, then become alcohol. This is a very, very simple process of the beer brewing at the beginning stage. Okay? That's why the malting and the maltose have a similar meaning about that. Another thing we also want to mention, this is related to the lacquer biology. Sometimes the amylase is existing in bacillus, in bacillus species, we could add. So remember, in a microbiology lab, what we did, we had other plates, and we split them onto two. The left side, we inoculate bacillus, subtilis, and the right side, we inoculated what? E. coli. Now, obviously, this agar not a traditional agar. This agar is a starch agar. So what happened after we inoculate the bacteria? Bacillus to use the starch become maltose, and the E. coli didn't use. So we're going to pull iodine, because iodine will react with starch. What we find, this area is 
still brownish color, and this area turns a little bit blue to brownish, or this area is colorless because the starch is already gone, has been hydrolyzed by amylase, become maltose, so iodine and starch no longer reacted with each other. And on the E. coli side, because E. coli do not have amylase, so starch did not hydrolyze, become maltose, and the starch reacted with iodine and become a relatively brownish color. Now we will talk about that. The different color relates to the different polymorphism and the structure of the starch. This we'll talk about on Thursday. Okay. So that's the second, the third thing what we want to talk about. Now, another thing we also want to say is that for the um, maltose, they also could generate is a sugar alcohol. The sugar alcohol is male title. And this sugar alcohol does not too sweet. So this is used in sugar less chocolate or they sometimes just say sugar free products. So just want to let you know. Now at the end we want to emphasize because the two glucose combined together, building one for glycosidic bonds, they have hemiacetal. So maltose is a reducing sugar. Okay, which means maltose could go through muta rotation process. When they dissolve in the Water, there will be a mixed balance, equilibrium mixed balance of different isomers. Okay, so this is the first thing. We talk about the maltose. Second thing we want to talk is lactose. Lactose has lots of, we call it mention, okay, but we want to go uh, relatively briefly, not too complicated. First of all, the chemical combination, lactose, is glucose combined with galactose. So we need to talk about the structure again. What are they looks like? Okay. Um, let me just remove this guy. And I'm going to add it right here. What the structure looks like? We already know glucose. So we're going to try it again. Let's say beta 1, H, OH, OH, H, OH, H, H, CH2, OH. OK, what is galactose? We talk about in our first class, when we talk about aldose, everything else is exactly the same. You could just move it together, okay? Exactly the same. The only difference is at carbon number four. What's the difference? This go down and that go up. So we say glucose and galactose is they are carbon four epimer, which is one type of the isomer when we talk about the aldose. Now, how they connected? That's not difficult. We already talked. So we just move these. And uh, this is, we put the draw like that, becomes a free aldehyde group. And this is hemiacetal. And uh, right here, 
one for glycose in the carbons. So it is also a reducing sugar. Okay. Now what we want to talk about something related to the nutrition. Uh, chemistry textbook, chemistry area also mention about nutrition sometimes. Where is lactose comes from? It's come from mammalian breast milk. An average, the, the lactose components, the concentration is 2 to 8.5 percent. This is typically, we say, in a cow milk, it is roughly 4.4 to 5.5 percent. In the sheep, it is about 4.2 percent. Well, could it be a little bit different in the human? It's a higher, 7.1 to 8.5%. Average, 7.5%. By all means, says lactose is a very good energy resource for infants. For infants during nursing period of time. Okay, that's important to, to know. Now, this is a, is a problem. Uh, when you were young, less than six, six years old, not a problem to have lactose. But when we are grown up, getting older, they're going to generate a problem. When you drink a milk, just a couple of hours later, you, or maybe less than 30 minutes, you have a diarrhea, cramping, and a gas fermentation. What happens is lactose intolerance. Now what happened? This is because you are lack the enzyme. The enzyme to break down lactose become glucose and the galactose is galactosidase. We also call it lactase. So what are gonna happen? If you do not have the lactase, or we say beta galactose, galactosidase in the body. Okay, this is an epithelial cell, the lumen epithelial cell. If I have a big chunk of lactose are still there, only partially or minimally fermented or hydrolyzed, what will happen? Inside of the epithelium cell, this is a high concentration of lactose. This is a lower concentration. So what is gonna happen? The water is gonna pour in there. Because osmotic unbalance. This is number one. Number two, more or less, the lactose there will be hydrolyzed a little bit by different bacteria in the intestinal. So we will generate the acid. This acid is limited. Will be cause irritation of colon which means triggers the bowel movement. At the same time, another product during the fermentation is gas will be generated. So it will cause cramping. These three together, you will have kind of diarrhea with 
a big fight. Okay? That's what happened. So, this happens when people drink a milk if they have not have enough lactose. It happens very often. There is an epidemiology research have been showing there is about like 30% of the people have the lactose intolerance. So what are we going to have to do? There are some suggested methods. Number one, 42%. Okay, 30 to 42%. So there are some suggested methods to, to do. You can do, you can drink fermented yogurt because fermented products, basically the lactose is hydrolyzed a little bit. So lactose become glucose with galactose and then furthermore will become lactic acid. Or we say lactate lots of the time. What are this? CH3, CH, OH, COOH. Become lactic acid. Okay, fermented yogurt. Number two, it's very interesting. We have been seeing people drinking milk have lactose intolerance. But when they drink milk powder, instant milk powder dissolved the solution, they not have the problem. Because when they make the milk powder, they do the freeze drying of milk, and then they add the lactase which means beta glycosidase. So, they added that, you don't have the problem. Number three, what are we going to do? Directly eating lactose, lactase, which means the enzyme. But most of the people do not do this one. Lots of people will pick is this guy. It's a milk powder. Okay, with adding lactose. So this is something we want to say. Another thing we also want to mention. Lactose is resistant to citric acid. And the other acids are slightly resistant. Last thing, very briefly mentioned. If in a microbiology class or in a genetics class, lactose could talk another an hour at least. What happened coming from microbiology class is this is CFU prime male y axis, this is time. At the beginning, people mixing with glucose and the lactose. Then put the equalizer. What they find the curve looks like? The curve looks like this. The bacteria use glucose first, and then they will use lactose. This relates to the lactose operon. It is both positive and negative control combined with CAMP. So just as very briefly mentioned, in the general microbiology class, genetics class, we talk about lacto-operin, at least one classes, and they make it like a maze, with different, or like a puzzle, with different situations, with glucose, without glucose, with lactose, without lactose, how the operin going to be moving, the functional gene, structure gene, that's some topic. We are not going to mention detail here, but just to let, let you know, there's a lots of topics we could talk about the lactose. Okay? Next one we want to talk, the last one. Uh, this should be this should be two actually. Uh, C. Sucrose. Okay. 
Uh, Ian, can you just move uh, yeah, just straight right there? That's very good. So sucrose. What is sucrose? Still disaccharides, but it is different. The chemical structure, it is combined with glucose and uh, fructose. This makes it special. Why? Glucose is aldose. Fructose is ketose. And when you look at here, glucose, galactose, glucose, glucose, they're all aldose. So make something special when the glucose and the fructose they combine. So how we do it, what's the structure difference? We mentioned it before, we're still gonna draw it, okay? This is we already know, we don't need to emphasize anymore. It's a glucose. So we go H, OH, we draw it. Everybody knows we draw many times during the semester. What the fructose looks like? It's a little bit special. That looks like this. Okay, what they do? CH2, OH, here is OH. H, OH, OH, H. This is a trick one, here is H, okay? CH2, OH. Now how they connect it? This guy and this guy. It is one, two, glycosidic bonds. So, this become a acido, a no free aldehyde. What means this? This is non-reducing sugar. Dr. Matak will ask you this question during your defense if she was your committee. In any chance, I guarantee you. No matter what you do, if you do bacteria, it doesn't matter. She will come out with this question. Why sucrose? is not a reducing sugar. The answer is right here. We're going to explain the structure. Very simple. We mentioned it lots of time. Lactose, maltose, maltose is head to tail when four glycosidic bonds. Sucrose, head to head. That is one, two glycosidic bonds. So no free available aldehyde. This is not aldehyde, okay? Don't be confusing, that's not. Okay, so this is something very important we want to mention here. Now, because sucrose is not a reducing sugar, no mutual rotation will happen. Not involved in Maillard reaction. We mentioned it. if they're gonna have a Maillard reaction for sucrose, sucrose need to break down, become glucose and the fructose, then they further to do that. So this is the first thing about sucrose. But sucrose is very important. This is made by 90% of the United States, the table, the table sugar is from sucrose. And we will measure manufacturing of table sugar real quick. And it is a major sweetener. And sucrose, very liable. All we say, sensitive to citric acid. 
So, the uh, easiest way in a solution to differentiate lactose and sucrose is right here. This is lactose, that is sucrose. I have citric acid, lactose resistant, sucrose sensitive. That's the easiest way to do. Okay. Sucrose, you also could make the drinking products heating more than 205 degrees Celsius will generate caramel. So that's called caramelization. We already mentioned, followed by the main other reaction, we talk about the sucrose. Okay? Let me just double check something else. We, uh, okay, one more thing we want to talk. Why sucrose is a very good sweetener? This is a very interesting figure we could talk about. So, y-axis is percentage of sugar in solution. And the x-axis is temperature, degree Celsius. So we could add them in 0, 20, 40, 60, 80, 100, then we have 20, 40, 60, 80, 100. What's the curve looks like? Lactose kind of like this. Glucose kind of like that. What's the sucrose looks like the curve? Like it. Very flat. That's sucrose. Which means it does not matter the temperature. You dissolve sucrose in a wide range of the temperature. The sweetness will not be changing too much because the amount of the sucrose dissolved in the solution will not be changed widely with the increasing of the temperature. This is, you understand, if you have a glucose powder, you dissolve in the water, you heat it a little bit, you are feeling it's a little bit sweetener, sweeter compared to in the cold temperature. Now, what's a maltose looks like? Maltose like this. This is curve for maltose. That research has been done in 1950s and 1940s. They have found the uh, sugar ingredients, the solution in the solution in a heated at different temperature. Okay, so that's uh, something about the sucrose uh, we want to mention about uh, in the in the detail. Okay, so why I talk sucrose at the end? Because sucrose is making the table sugar. So, we're going to make sure we will spend in the rest of the class talk about the manufacturing of the sugar in the United States, how they do it. And I have a couple of examples, I have one example I'm going to be mentioned uh, when we talk. So, manufacturing of table sugar. Okay, the manufacturing of the table sugar in the United States basically have two methods and two different resources. It could come from sugar cane. What is the sugar cane looks like? Sugar cane. Like this, there is leafy there, very thin, very high, very tall, averagely 10 to 20 feet. Could be more than 20 meters if it's a very long one. So sugar cane is a grass. I didn't see any of the sugar cane in the United States in adjusting a market. We still could get sugar cane in some of the Chinese 
grocery store in Pittsburgh. I never eaten here, but I, when I was like 10 years old, we eat a lot. What it looks like, this is the bag, what I get from Chinese grocery store over the weekend. That's what the picture looks like. So what is that? Like a bamboo. And when you peel it, you can eat it. You're gonna have to bite really hard. And what happens is you're crushing it like you're doing the mealing, and all the crust comes out, all the sugar comes out, very sweet, very sweet juice. And what happens at the end, all these crust is stick into your teeth. You have to use toothpick to took them out. I never do anything here, but I did it when I was young. There's a joke. Some the boy in the kindergarten or in the first grade look a little bit over, overweight and then biting the sugar can, it look like a panda eating the bamboo. So just want to let you know the story, that what looks like the sugar can. Like a panda eating a bamboo, okay? However, sugar cane, there is a little bit of issue is, this is a seasoning. Uh, this is a seasoning. So, only like later spring, summer and early fall, they can be growing and harvesting. And uh, in the winter time, they definitely doesn't have much um, generate. So what happens to sugar cane? You have to make it become raw brown sugar. Okay, and then the raw brown sugar have to go in through refining factory. And this re refining factory usually in the nearby location and going through refining process become white edible sugar. And the low brown sugar basically is not a commercial product. In the exception, maybe a one product called sugar in law. But what you find in the market is white edible sugar and refined, refined edible sugar. So during the seasoning, they are going to have to harvesting a lot of the sugar cane, generate raw brown sugar, and then when they do the refining, it's in a nearby factory, it does not affect it by the weather, so they could do this all day long. Okay, that's the first one. The second one, it's coming from sugar beets. Okay, what's the sugar beets looks like? I don't have an example. Sugar beets looks like, looks like a carrot, but more like a yam. And a little bit purple color to red color because the colorant is called and so, cyanine. I used to talk about the color measurements, coloration, but we don't have that. Uh, nobody can testing that one anymore, so we skip that. So the sugar beets, we're gonna be cut into the V shape, going through the counter current hard water, then going through refining process. But they will skip the low brown sugar and directly become white edible refined sugar that is a little bit different and this is you could do all year long and uh, you don't have to really make stick to the couple of seasons so that's a major difference between these two so we want to talk about how they manufacture so let's talk about the sugar cane first Okay, the first thing, when you have this sugar cane, okay, let's just draw some little bit picture right here. They will first do, 
is milling, okay, crushing, become juice. This is doing in the uh, factory, crushing in the milling. You have the machine do that, like we do uh, poultry feeds. The juice basically is low acid. The pH is around five to six. So they gotta go in through a first step of clarification. How they do? They will be dissolved in heated lime solution. Or we just say heating liming. What is that? Calcium hydroxide. Okay, that means they're buffering the pH. So next step, they will go through multiple effect vacuum evaporation of vacuum multiple effect vacuum evaporator. Um, how they do that? This has to be done in a low temperature. At the last step, around 4 to 5 degrees Celsius. Why? They have to avoid the chemical thermal decomposition. Okay, so at this moment, what they will generate basically is like a syrup. But this syrup, you need to make sure 65% dissolved solids, a roughly 40% sugar. Now, when this syrup comes out, what are they going to do? Save the space, I'm going to go up like, like this. They're going to have to go in through is a vacuum pan crystallization. How they do it? They will be using a vacuum pan. And this vacuum pan is already being seeded with sucrose. The sucrose is grounded, so they are seeding with grind sucrose. Sometimes you add isoperyl, isoperyl uh, alcohol. Modified alcohol, you can understand. So what's the function of that? The so sucrose could help generate a sugar crystal. And the sugar crystal have two steps to generate. One step is migration. So sucrose is going to be migrate and moving into the crystal surface. And the second, they will form in the matrix, which is crystal matrix. OK, so that's a step. Then what they do is centrifuge. OK, when they do the centrifuge, what are going to be generated? If you do a centrifuge, they will have a two parts. In the precipitation parts, this is raw brown sugar. And on the up here, 
This is a color is very brownish color. Very sticky. Morosis. Morosis is a byproduct. Morosis in our textbook, if you do a literature review, they have two further usable way to do. Number one, they could manufacture become animal feeds. Number two, because more or less they have some sugar, they could further fermented become alcohol. I didn't see any of the products, but maybe may have some. Now the upper layer here. Sometimes you could go back to redo the process like here, which means recrystallization or re vacuum evaporation until it's purified a little bit. Now it's very interesting. This is a bag, what I got from the Chinese grocery store I just mentioned. I don't think anybody buy it, so they're putting a separate bag, which is a, have a discount price, it's only $1.5. Then I, I go one, uh, because I'm going to teach. This Chinese word means sucrose. They look at the ingredients, they never mention sucrose, which means sugar and Molasses. So I took it out what it looks like. That's what's a molasses crystal. If you make a crystal sugar, use molasses. And yesterday I make a raw sorbing milk myself at home and I put a big piece of this inside. It doesn't taste it doesn't taste very sweet. The only thing the whole the whole tub turns brownish color. So I just want to tell you, they do have some of people, instead of making animal feeds or make fermented alcohol, 